Welcome back to Bargaining 101. I'm William Spaniel, and this lecture is on the power of rejection. It's something that I cover in Chapter 4 of Game Theory 101 Bargaining. You can check the video description for more information on that. Recall that last time we looked at a game where Barbara had the ability to reject Albert's initial proposal, force a second period, and then make a counteroffer. And we saw that in that model, with that ability, Barbara actually gained bargaining power. She was able to obtain some of the surplus for herself, and she forced Albert to make concessions to her. But as I alluded to, there's still an open question here. Where did that bargaining power come from precisely? Did it come from her ability to reject the offer and force a second period? Or did it come from her ability to propose a counteroffer? And maybe it was a combination of those two. Was it mostly the ability to reject, or was it mostly the ability to propose a counteroffer? Well, as of right now, we are unsure which is which, and which is actually a better source of bargaining power. But fortunately, this modeling process allows us to arrive at a very specific answer. So remember that last time we were looking at this game here. This is that single counteroffer game that Albert is making an offer in and then Barbara can accept or make a counteroffer and then Albert finally accepts or rejects. So again, this is exactly the game that we were looking at last time. And I'm only going to make one single modification to this game other than the labeling. And that single important strategic modification is that instead of Albert and Barbara having a second period where Barbara makes the offer to Albert, I'm just going to adjust that by flipping those moves. So now in that second period, it's not Barbara proposing a counteroffer, it's Albert proposing a second offer to Barbara, which Barbara accepts or rejects. So by looking at this model, we can see whether it's the ability for Barbara to reject the first offer and force a second period that's allowing her to gain bargaining power and gain concessions, or it was the fact that she was the one making the counteroffer in that second period. So how do we solve this game? Well, just like any other strategic situation, we start at the end and work our way backward. So let's ignore the first half of the game, the first period of bargaining, and look at just the second period of bargaining. Well, if we look at Barbara's reject decision, we see that she receives nothing from rejecting. Well, that means she is willing to accept any offer whatsoever. Putting yourself into Albert's shoes, what do you do there? Well, if Barbara is willing to accept any offer whatsoever, you take as much as you can for yourself, and that entails demanding everything for yourself and leave nothing extra left over for Barbara. So Barbara will, Barbara will receive none of the surplus in this case, Albert is going to demand everything and take it, which means Albert's payoff in this game, in the second period, is for him to receive everything times delta, or one times delta, or simply delta, and for Barbara to receive zero times delta, or simply zero. Again, we have to incorporate the discount factor here because we're in that second period, but conditional on the fact that we're only bargaining essentially over a value of delta at this point instead of the full one, Albert is still receiving all of those benefits, and Barbara is receiving none of them. Well, now that we know what happens in the second stage of the game, we can take that information and look at the first stage of the game. So we know in the second stage that Albert earns delta and Barbara earns zero. So if we plug that into the first stage of the game, well, now we can solve this part of the game as well. Notice that here, once more, if Barbara rejects, she receives a value of zero. So, once more, Barbara is willing to accept any offer whatsoever. Putting yourself into Albert's shoes, what do you do there? Well, again, once more, if you're Albert, you try to take as much as you can for yourself. And because Barbara is willing to accept any offer that you make her, you might as well demand everything for yourself and leave nothing left over for Barbara. So Barbara receives none of that surplus. And of course, if you're Albert, in this case, that means you take the entire good for yourself, or a value of one, and that's better for you than forcing Albert, or forcing a situation where Barbara is going to reject, which of course she's not even going to do anyway. So the end game for Albert here is that Albert demands everything, he sets x equal to one, and Barbara accepts. So Albert, once more, receives the entire surplus, just like in an ultimatum game, and Barbara receives none of that surplus. 
So what that means is that if we compare this result, the result that we just saw by having Albert make the second offer in the second period, well, in that situation, Barbara has no bargaining power. Yet in a situation where if Barbara rejects and then is able to make that counteroffer, Barbara was gaining some of the surplus. So in that case, she did have bargaining power. In turn, what that means is that rejecting and causing delay does not give you any bargaining power. It's really in the ability to make proposals. Proposal power is bargaining power. Rejection is not bargaining power. So this title of this lecture, The Power of Rejection, is a lie. There is no power in rejection. The power comes purely from having proposal control at some point later on in the interaction. We'll take a look at more situations where there are more periods of bargaining later on. For now, I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.